בלימוד הזה, לכל הצדיקים אמיתיים שבאדם לא יכול לצאת אמיתיים שלך נאפה ולא שמצא מאפה ולפרש את תיק יסוד עולם נאכלנו במקור חומה רבי נחמן ואין פגע ואין שמחה דנא תחמן אחר מומן זכו אותו ולכו תם יגננו והכל יישא בימו אמן for the רפואה שלמה בעזרת השם with this class let's give out some names for people that we could do רפואה שלמה so I'll start with some unless some people want to just send out some names רחל בצר Sarah Bat Chaya for people that are sick. Yair Ghazel Bat Emma Simcha. Anybody else? Yaakov Ben Berta, Daniel Yehuda Ben Rivka Shoshana, Esther Bat Chaya, Rivka Bat Esther Malka, Sarah Bat Chaya, Binyamin Ben Chana, Batya Bat Sarah, Shimon Ben Jacqueline, Shani Chaya Bat Miriam, Yonatan Ben Lea, and Gadol ben Zisle and Yarden ben Orli. And Bezat Hashem, in the merit of all of the holy tzaddikim, may all these people have a, a quick recovery. Amen. Uh, we're going to do for the elevation of the souls of the people that have passed away. If you have any names of people, Suzanne, but. Hannah? Simon? Simon, but Hannah. But אלעזר בן דוד ורוחמה, רוסת בת פחה, מנשה בן רחל ומסוד, קלרה עוד בת שמחה, רודי, מעמד יסבא מבת יש נגנסיה, מרים בת יהושע, מאיר בן קלרה, ניסים בן אסתר, מסעודה בת בלח, ז'ינת נינה חיה, בת יוסף גידליה, אלמור חמים בן שלום אל-ג'אז', נפתלי דניאל בן סוליקה, רייזל בת פחל, רחל חיה יפה בת ויקטורה מרים, סימון בן חנה, ואילן מסיקה בן שושנה. מי עוד נשמות הבליות, נשמתם צורה בצור חיים. Amen. 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 So tonight's class is going to be a little bit different than the other classes. We always do the classes a little bit uh, mystical, and then I try to take some key takeaways at the end, and we usually connect it to the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, which we're going to still do tonight, of course, because he's my Rav, and where would I be without him? But um, aside from that, tonight we're actually going to start off with the teachings of the Arizal to lay the groundwork of the parasha, and this is Parashat Kitisa the parasha that's very famous for the golden calf. So we're going to talk about the sin of the golden calf, what happened, what's the deal behind it, what was the symbolism behind it, how did the Jews recover from it, and why was it such a big sin. And we're going to start off by explaining it with the teachings of the Arizal, specifically from Shah Abzubim. And, and he also quotes different parts of his works from Shah Gilgulim, which is his book on reincarnations as well, which are going to bring us proofs for some of the stuff. And once we understand the story Kabbalistically, and what happened with the Arizal, we're then going to start going into some other questions to understand the story about how it's more applicable today. But it's going to kind of give you guys a little bit of an insight to show you how deep the actual story of what happened with the Chet Agel was. And I don't usually spend so much time saying so much of the Zohar, the Arizal in the class, even though we bring it up sometimes. But the reason why I'm doing it this time is because it really is a beautiful teaching um, that shows you how deep every single little piece of how God put the world together is and how everything kind of works in one aspect to be able to help bring the Jews back, hopefully, and bring the Mashiach. So, with that being said, I'm going to start off with the Arizal, and then I'm going to work my way into some of the teachings that um, is quoted by the Shvile Pinchas, which he brings the Khtam Sofer, and he brings the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov and Rabbi Noam Eli Melech. So a lot of stuff from the time of the Baal Shem Tov's time, which was about a few hundred years ago. So he's very special Hasidim. And then after that, I'm going to come back full circle on what Rabbi Nachman says and Rabbi Natan says to help bring this kind of full circle with some of my personal thoughts as I was learning this. So to start um, in the very beginning, the story, and I'm going to do the shorter version of what was written down in the Arizal because a lot of it gets very, very deep. But to try to make it as simple as possible and stop me if any of it gets too confusing along the way so everyone understands and then we'll, we'll pass along it as we go through it. So in the very beginning, it's talking specifically about the story that happens in this week's parsha between Moshe, obviously, that goes up the mountain to go start learning the Torah for 40 days and 40 nights. 
uh, there's a miscounting of days by the Jewish people. And the Jewish people on the 40th day, essentially miscounting by six hours, start building and they try to create this idol, essentially, which was a golden calf and is made completely of gold. And now Rizal is going to dissect this whole story and talk about it. So the main players in this story are going to be Moshe Rabbeinu, who's obviously Moshe the Tzaddik, the, the Moshe Mashiach, the concept of the person that's the redeemer of the Jewish people. Then you have um, Bilam, but Bilam is not brought up that much, even though he's not necessarily cited in the parasha that to in correlation to this it's important because of you're going to see his sons and just to give you a little bit of the the three generations that was around Bilam is that we had Bilam who was connected not only in the Gemara and in the Kabbalah as being said to have been the prophet but of the evil side okay to the point that Bilam was actually a reincarnation of Lavan so his soul was actually in the house of Lavan so when Yaakov went over there to go get his wife the level of impurity and the degree of which the evil forces in the world existed at Lavan's house was the darkest that had ever existed. And it was a, such a dark form of impurity that Yaakov was even hesitant to go there in the first place because he didn't know what was worse, Esav or Lavan. Now, Bil'am's father is called Be'or, right? And his children, which are referenced in the Zohar, I believe it's um, page 119 or 190, I have to look it up, 191a. Um, in Parashat Shemot, the Zohar, if you want to reference the Zohar that Darizal is quoting for this, if you want to look at the sections over there, names the two sons of Bil'am, which was Yonus and Yombrus. Okay? And these two, all of these people are playing and they're trying to fight with black magic from the forces of the evil negative sides of energy to try to dismantle the Jewish people and work with the Erev Rav, which were the collected Jews that were not the righteous Jews that exited Egypt, that God specifically put... Um, was supposed to leave them behind, but Moshe wanted to take them. And part of the descent that occurred was that Moshe wanted to elevate these souls, even though they were not ready to be elevated or be brought out. And so part of what Moshe had to repair here and what he did was prematurely try to elevate souls that were not supposed to be separated yet. And they were not supposed to come up from their level. And part of it is going to connect with the Midrashim and later on in the stories that we're going to get into. So what actually ended up happening over here is that Yonus and Yombrus, and this is even brought down in the Zohar that I wasn't even really planning on talking about this, but just as a very small anecdote, the Zohar in this section of this parasha discusses something incredible for those that want to go look at it after. It says how Yonus and Yombrus were some of the highest degree professionals of black magic at the time. They pulled their energy from Bil'am and from their grandfather Beor. Now when Beor had passed away, he had been reincarnated because how evil he was and how much evil force he had brought to the world. He had been reincarnated into grass, into the for the lowest form of life, essentially, that exists. It's not mineral. And in Shara Gilgulim, the Arizal talks about an introduction 22, in Gate 22 of the introductions of Shara Gilgulim, the book of reincarnations. The Arizal discusses the four different levels of how people can be reincarnated. And so the lowest level is mineral, which is essentially rocks, stones, gold, silver, things like that. Um, Darizal actually has famous stories about how he even elevated souls that were in the level of mineral at his time. Darizal actually elevated all the souls of all the people that were at his time, which is actually a very special holy thing, but only the Tzadik Yisodolam can do things like this. So, Baal Shem Tov, Arizal, Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Moshe Rabbeinu, they can do this because it's the soul of Moshe that keeps coming back. Now, feel free to stop me at any point if this is a little bit confusing. There's four degrees, and this is why there's also degrees of the levels of the soul. There's also degrees of worlds also. So there's lots of parallels to this. But there's the inanimate and the mineral level. The above that, there's things that are living but not movable, essentially like plants, trees, flowers, things like that, that are living and they have some form of life, but they just don't move. Then there's the animals, which have a degree above that, which are essentially movable, livable creatures. And then above that, there's human beings, which are essentially the highest degree, and that's why also they stand up, because there's lessons and there's, there's teachings that mystically connected to the fact that our mind is actually the highest elevated point on a human body. We stand up straight as opposed to animals that align their liver, their heart, and their mind at the same degree mm -hmm. to show you how they're animalistic. And whenever we're not acting like human beings, essentially trying to elevate our thoughts and our hearts and aligning ourselves to be properly acting as human beings, then we actually fall to the degree of animal or even lower than that, not moving. David, can you have a plant that's greater than an animal? Can you have a plant that's greater than an animal? A tree that's going to provide life and shade and everything against an animal that you just So every one of them, every single creation and every single being has a purpose. And every single one of them has an incredible piece of it. So there's stories of the Baal Shem Tov, there's stories of Rabbi Chaim Pinto, 
of, actually there's a story about Rabbi Moshe Pinto, I believe, right? Whenever he was traveling, and I think he was in the zoo in London or in Paris. Is that Rabbi Moshe Pinto? I think it was Rabbi Moshe Pinto, the father of Rabbi Yaakov and, and uh, the grandfather of Rabbi Moshe, that one time he had randomly been traveling and I believe he had stopped in Paris specifically for a couple of days and he had talked to his, his son, I was studying in yeshiva at the time, and said, I'm going to be passing for a couple of days. And he had this random trip where he said, I want to go to the zoo. He went to the zoo and I'm making the story much faster, but in short, he went to the zoo, he went to the lion's cage. Mm -hmm. And as he got close to the line, he took an apple out of his pocket of his jacket. He said, Boe Priyaetz. People answered, Amen. He walked away. A few moments later, there was a great commotion in the zoo. Everybody started going a little bit crazy. And they realized that the lion had died. After when they were walking away and they left, people started asking him, what happened? What was the whole deal? Why'd you go to the zoo? He just went to the lion's cage and then he left. He didn't even really go see all the other animals and stuff like that. So they added a weird question for him. He said that this nishama had been coming back in many Gilgulim and had been staying at this zoo for just a week on display before was being transported to another zoo and to another place in the world. And he saw that as he was traveling, he was able to elevate the soul of this animal. So he went and he specifically had to do a bracha next to it to do part of that elevation. And when he did that, and the animal can hear the bracha and be elevated through that, the animal passed away because it finished his job and then he could leave and he did his job. So the point into answering it is that Everything has a purpose, and we're going to get into it today a little bit, maybe in the section of the Arizal. But the point is that um, we don't really see it, we don't really understand it, and this is why it's so important to do everything and to try to find godliness everywhere. And that's going to be the point at the end of it. But the beauty is that, is there something that can be potentially higher in an, in an upper level of a, of a degree of livelihood? Like essentially, could a human be of a lower degree than that of an animal? To the traditional understanding, no, because the lower, the lower it is, is the more it has to correct. So it, the point is to elevate it to the level of man, correct it at man, and correct all the sins at that point, and then at that point be able to be completely elevated and then not have to come back again and then restore the soul back to its place and go to Gan Eden. Um, in fact, many people even argue that even coming down to this world is a punishment. So many people will say that when you pass away from this world, but this is a longer conversation, I don't want to get too sidetracked, if you get offered up there to go to Gehenom for a little bit to cleanse something or to come down to this world again to repair your tikkun, you immediately take Gehenom. You don't come back down because there's no guarantees in this world. And so lots of them are punishments. And the further away you get, the bigger the punishment is. And so because he was so far away, he had been reincarnated into grass, into this, this form of uh, this plant life. So David, how can the neshama that comes back in an animal can make the, the tikkun? So sometimes it, it comes back because there's different parts of the Zohar, there's different Gemarot, there's different sections of the Kabbalah that discuss it. Some of it has to do with the sins that you performed and rectifying those sins. Some of them talk about different books, discuss if you do a specific type of sin and that's the main sin that you perform in this world, then you will come back as a specific type of animal and you'll have to rectify it in that way. It's very dark, it's very, very... Um, we're not going to really get into it because I don't want to trip people out too much. But the idea is that everything has a connection between all the actions that we perform. That's why sometimes when we come back in Gilgulim, and that's why sometimes it's very important. This is why we don't judge. If you ever go through a circumstance in life where you deal with like an accident or, or someone, you have to deal unfortunately with a sickness or you, have, you lose money, right? Money is a very good example of this. Um, Rabbi Nachman actually famously says that if you ever have a way to rectify something, with money to be able to pay down a debt or to be able to do something that you know you're rectifying with your tikkun, immediately get rid of your money and don't ever have to use any of your miracles or don't ever have to use any divine intervention. Specifically use money if you can to pay down as much of the debt as you can spiritually for things that have done in previous lives. And the connection with that is that we're also rectifying in Gilgulim whenever we're doing actions in this world that may not have been relevant to us. So sometimes when we're doing the Kriyat Shema Amita whenever we're, we're going to sleep at night, we're saying sorry for things that we didn't even do. Even sometimes when we do vidui in the prayer, whenever we're saying khatat yaviti pashati, we're saying sorry for the things that we've done. Why, why do you say murder? Why do you say theft? Why do you say all those types of things? What if, what if you didn't do half the sins on the list? It's because you're rectifying things of previous lives. So that's how deeply connected it is, even at night when you're falling asleep. And so sometimes an action that's going to happen, and I can share stories, but will go on forever, about how the Baal Shem Tov was telling sometimes students and sometimes that Rizal had people that came to him and they said, well, why did I lose this money or why did this happen to me? 
And they're saying that it's because in a previous life you had stolen money, you had come back and you had to lose the money to rectify it. So either you can go do a lawsuit and try to get your money back and then you're gonna have to come back in a Gilgulim again in another 100 years from now and it'll never end. Or you can accept the fact that this happened to you, swallow your pride, understand that you're rectifying something that has been coming back for 500 years and then move on to the next thing and now your soul doesn't need to come back. So when you understand how there's a much bigger picture at play, um, it's very, very helpful in being able to help put things into perspective and, and kind of go about uh, living your life a better way and connect to Hashem. So with that being said, money count. what? Money I know the money every <laughs> single time. No, I'm just putting away the parachot. <laughs> so, um, so we said the four different degrees of, of life. Now, let's, look how interesting this is. So he quotes from Shara Gilgulim, he quotes from the different sections of the Zohar, and he starts explaining to you this idea that people need to elevate their souls. Now, in the section of Shara Gilgulim, the Arizal, right, Rav Yitzchak Luaya, says that essentially the way to elevate it happens at different times during the year. There's months where the inanimate is elevated to the life, uh, to the life but not movable uh, level. There's the point where they move from essentially plant life to animal life. And then there's months where you move from animal life to human life. And you can only be rectified and elevated in specific months. You cannot do it at any point during the year. So it's very special times to be able to do it. And the holidays work with this as well. So it's very, very special. And that's why everything is kind of predestined in a certain aspect to allowing people to be able to elevate souls in the right time. What is the name of the bracha that we do once a year for the trees? Yeah, oh, that'd be a kata, yeah. with, with, um... When there are some that are like... Uh, in oranges or fruits and something, and we do something once a year to free them. Oh, um, I'm, I might be blanking on what on what it is. You're not talking about. Um... The cat. Uh, no, because uh, Rabbi Yaakov Pinto mentioned that one year he did it, and he had a beautiful orange tree, and the next day there were no oranges at all. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It so, like that Rizal actually has that around two bishvat that he has a segula of wrapping your brachot and your notes onto trees. And there's a lot of mysticism behind this because the birkat alanot is actually the yeah. So the birkat alanot, the one that you do for the blessings of the of the of the trees, essentially. But you actually are celebrating the fruit, so you're actually celebrating the produce that comes from trees. So even though it's the New Year's of trees and not the New Year's of fruits, you're actually celebrating the the thing that comes from it, but not the actual thing itself. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there's reasons for it, but it's all connected in that respect. And so over here, what actually had happened was Yonus and Yombrus, the two grandsons of Beor, had come back and they had wanted to bring their, uh, their grandfather up to a higher spiritual level to be able to combat the spirituality of Moshe. And so the second Moshe had left, they saw that there was an opportunity at the time to be able to elevate the neshama of the evil forces of the klipa from the side of their grandfather, essentially from Bilam's father. And Bilam was actually the parallel to Moshe in evil force. In fact, some even argue that Bilam could even perform evil forces and be accepted with his evil forces at times when Moshe couldn't even accept on the side of Kedusha, on the side of holiness, to show you at what degree of impurity he was actually performing his, his, uh, his miracles. So what was... Um, What's very special is that in order to understand this, I want to just add one little point back from a couple Midrashim and a, and a story that happened actually a few parshiot ago, or actually from the very beginning, before Parashat. Um, it's actually connected with Beshalach, with the splitting of the sea. As the Zohar says, the sea split because of the bones of Yosef. And we know that Moshe, before he left Egypt, right in the very beginning in Shemot, and at the very end when Yosef passed away, at the end of the book of Bereshit, in Vayachi, we see that... Um, that when Yosef had passed away, he had specifically hid his coffin and he had specifically, his bones had been hidden in the Nile River in a way that no one else can find him because we know from the Zohar and even from when Yaakov Avinu wrote it in the Pasha, black on white, they didn't want to find his bones because they were going to, or keep him buried there because they were going to turn him into a god. Mm -hmm. so they were going to turn him into a god. So Yosef was actually hidden in the Nile. Moshe did some special Kabbalah where he took essentially uh, a form of, he, he took a, something to write on, and he wrote Alishor, which is the source of the bracha of where um, Yosef pulls his bracha. Alishor just means rise ox, rise ox. And it's a reference to Yosef, whose symbol of his tribe is the ox. And so when Moshe wrote this, he put it in the water, because Moshe also had control over the waters as well, because he was also saved because of the waters in the river, uh, in the Nile River. And Yosef's bone rose. Moshe was able to take Yosef's bones and then take him out of Egypt and then help bring him 
into the desert and help bury him eventually in Israel. That was one of the things that they had to do. When he had written this, on some argue and say that it was a golden plaque. When they did this, he also had written names of Hashem on it as well, according to some. A person named Micha came and took this plaque from the river after Moshe had done this, had performed this, and took it and kept it. Now, Micha was a person that was part of the Erevrav and was a person that was part of the evil forces in Egypt because they were doing so much torturous activity to Jews, what actually ended up happening was that Micha was one of the small children that was placed instead of a brick in the walls as they were building structures in Egypt. And when Moshe saw that this boy was being tortured, a young innocent boy that was in the wall, uh, he wanted to save him from actually dying in the Egyptian procedure because the Egyptians actually killed thousands of Jewish children this way, as it's written in the Mitash, by killing them and subjecting them to labor and to making them do all these types of things. So when they had done this, Moshe saw this and had a lot of mercy on this child, but at the same time had an argument with Hashem because Hashem said, um, leave him because he's going to eventually do something bad for the Jewish people. But Moshe said, I want to save those types of people because part of the Zohar discusses it in the mixed multitudes, essentially the different levels of Moshe that were good and bad from the sources that he had to uproot, which that's the parts that I didn't want to really get into. He decided through his benefits to take this child, save this child. And this is the child that eventually grew up and eventually took this plaque. Now, the reason why this is relevant is because now, as the Jews, now you have the mix of these people, you have Yonus Yom Rusmika, then you have the situation that's happening with Datan and Aviram, or the head essentially of the Erev Rav. Remember a few weeks ago, maybe a month and a half ago, we actually discussed the level of Datan and Aviram and how impure they actually were. Remember we said Datan and Aviram's souls come from the worlds before this world even existed. And they come from a level so impure that all they do is to be able to destroy the concept of the tzaddik. Because the world that they come from, there was no tzaddik. And that's where the Satan pulled the energy of. And that's essentially where the Samech Mem and the, and the angel of death essentially pull all the energy that was essentially placed with Datan and Aviram, that they were the advisors of Paro to help subjugate the Jews to even more pain while they were in Egypt. And the Tan and Aviram get all the gold, they go and essentially talk to Aaron, and they say, we want to make another god. And when they do this, they essentially throw all the gold, they take all the gold from their wives, they gave it very quickly, everybody participated, and everybody gave gold, essentially, to help build this idol. Uh, not the woman, huh? No, the women didn't no. participate in the actual thing, <laughs> but the women gave over part of their gold from their husbands, some argue then say that they were forced to do so. Women and once leave. they did, yeah, and the Levim as well. Of course, the Levim were not because the Levim were part of the work of the Beit HaMikdash. And we talked about Levi because of Simcha and also the place in, uh, in, in Mitzran that they were untouched from work because Goshen, where the Levim stayed, was Gematria Simcha because they entered into Simcha and they never fell to slavery. So, just to show you the importance of Simcha. Now, to come full circle, we're going to wrap up the Arizal and then we're going to start moving on to some of the other stuff. What ended up happening here, and this is incredible, you have this concept from Shah Gilgunim of the levels of the souls that need to be elevated. They were trying to pull it from evil energy because Moshe was not around to try to do it from the side of Bilam. And you have the two grandsons that are now teaming up essentially with Mika, the Erev Rav, and the Tanaviram. And what's happening here is they're grabbing all the gold, they're throwing it into the fire, and they form this golden calf. And at first it's not moving. And then Mika throws the golden plate in it because it's Ale Shor, Ale Shor, because it's a reference to Yosef, but then it also does what? It starts bringing this calf to life. In, through black magic and through all the kavanot. The Zohar says that I believe Yonus and Yombus specifically went to Aaron HaKohen, the high priest, the brother of Moshe. And after they killed Hur, who was essentially the brother-in-law, who was married to Miriam, the holy tzaddik at the time, because he immediately declined doing the golden calf. They immediately killed him on the spot. Aaron saw that they were going to kill all the righteous people, so they started to help delay the process and participate. And Aaron, the high priest, essentially participated in the golden calf. We're going to get into the reason why he was participating in it. What they did in the process, the Zohar says, is that they actually forced him to separate his fingers and do what the Kohen Gadol does, and elevate his hands in a way that the Zohar explains that he started opening up the gates in heaven, and all the evil forces started rising up and causing chaos in the upper realms. And this is what allowed for Hashem eventually to tell Moshe, you have to descend now, because now they're starting to cause chaos. And then Aaron was able to rectify it after and quickly build a Mishkan. And when he went to build the Mishkan, or to build an altar to do a sacrifice to correct all those things, they had then start to do the golden calf on that, on that altar. And then when they started doing all these procedures, they threw in the golden plaque, they brought it to life. And what ended up happening in this process is after that, they fed him grass. 
and they fed the cow grass. And then what happened is the nishama of Be'ol that was reincarnated in grass through evil forces was able to enter into the level of animal and was entering into the level of the golden calf. And then the Midrashim even say, and some of, I forgot which section of the Kabbalah, I'm, I'm blanking on it, but it's incredible, says that the, then the, the golden calf started, started to speak and tell people, now you have to worship me. And it started doing all this form of idol worship at the time, instead of Moshe. At the same time, they didn't do Abu Dazaha, they, like they, they wanted to replace God. Exactly. Replace Moshe. Exactly. Like, as a, a so that's, right? that's actually something very important, which we're going to get into tonight. And as we start transitioning out of the Arizal, that was the Arizal just to be able to lay a little bit of groundwork to show you how deep the process that was occurring here and how powerful the idol worship was. A couple quick notes. The Jewish people, not everybody participated in the, in the golden calf. Most of it, according to most commentaries, was the Erev Rav. Essentially, the majority of the evil people were participating in it. And some other people participated. A lot of people contributed gold. But everybody had participated in the sin because on a very simple level, which we discussed last time with Amalek and Haman and Purim in last week's class, is that they create one thing. They create doubt. And what the Jews had at that moment was a doubt. They had a doubt and belief in their God, a doubt and belief mostly in what was Moshe. What is the power of the tzaddik? Can you define Actually, what Erev Rav exactly is. So Erev Rav... There are many things, like the Egyptian who joined us. Yes, um, there's different commentaries on it. It's not so much important to be able to say exactly what they were as much as what the ideology was. And the point of the Erev Rav is that essentially they were people, whether they were converted Egyptians, people that had come back to God because they saw the miracles and they had had negative intentions and they knew they were going to help the Jews sin later whether they come from the evil forces that were just supposed to be the opposite force to the holiness of the Jewish people, and God put them there as a test, which we'll actually get into in a second type of commentary in a little bit. The point is that these are the types of people that help Jew, that they act as the evil inclination. And they are the people that are the bad people that essentially help people sin or they help people fall. They help bring negative intention towards situations. Erev Rav is a concept that still exists today. It's hidden. We don't understand it. But there are people today that act as Erev Rav. Essentially, any person, I, I say this openly in some of the classes, it's a little bit controversial, but anybody that essentially speaks badly about Jewish people, anybody that doesn't help people get close to the tzaddik I met or tzaddikim in general is Erev Rav. Um, people that essentially avoid the concept of any time a person's like, I don't talk about Rabbi Shalom Bar Yochai, or I don't talk about Darizal, or I don't talk about Rabbi Nachman or stuff, it, it's coming from the evil side of forces. So some t back then, Erev Rav didn't appear in the same appearance as it does today. Back then, Erev Rav would have been much more apparent as people that were pulling from negative energy. Um, you still saw even Erev Rav in the times of, you go back in times of the Moroccan Sadiqim, in the times of the Ramchal, you had people like Shabtai Tzvi, you had people that were false prophets. These are people that are considered Erev Rav. Exactly, Mitzure Karta. The people that have Israel that, that go negotiate with Iran is, is pure, it's pure Erev Rav. Mitnagdim? Uh, Mitnagdim is, is, I'll be honest with you. So, uh, I don't want to get too controversial and also get sidetracked. It's more, I don't care so much about the controversy, but I care more about, uh, I care more about the timing and not getting sidetracked. Mitnagdim, essentially, for those that don't know, it comes from the word mitnaged, which means opposing or against. Mm -hmm. They're essentially against the works of the Hasidut, which are essentially the teachings that come down from the Baal Shem Tov, which were essentially 300 years ago. And the ideas that essentially led everybody to judge every single Jew favorably, never judge a single person. The ways of being able to study a little bit of the mysticism of the Torah, be able to teach the mysticism of the Torah. That's exactly what you said, the people opposing the tzaddik. So Torah. the people that, but here's the thing, if a person is born into the soul of a person that is a mit naged, but let's say the person sits down and studies halakha and gemara and is completely against studying the Zohar, but doesn't speak negatively against it, mm. it's just a nishama that's coming into the world that, I'm going to get into it because I'm going to speak about Baal Shuvas in a little bit. So I don't want to get too much into it. But just a little finite point about it is that it is an issue. It is an issue just black and white without getting so much into how bad it is or it's not. I'm not going to consider it Erev Rav, even though some would. The point is that the second a person starts speaking negatively about big tzaddikim, Arizal, Baal Shem Tov, Rabbi Nachman, Abraslev, even, you know, Alta Rebbe, if you start talking about bad about the Baba Sali or people that did Kabbalah, you know, or... If you start talking about the Hasidim at the time, the, the uh, Maggid of Mezerich, if you start talking about, about Rabbi Noam Elimelech, Rav Zusha, all holy people, essentially, and Hasidim, the people that studied the mystical works and had acted in Simcha and had acted in this way, then you have a very big problem because essentially you're trying to argue against the people that were actually the holiest. So if you are a person that is going to pull from that side of energy, that you're going to argue that that they shouldn't be doing that, then you have to do it from a position of strength and that you have to yourself be of the degree of that holiness. 
But because the people of that strength don't pull from that holiness, unless Hashem puts them as an opposing force, which means technically it's negative because the other ones are from a side of holiness, the error is that, and I'm sorry that it's complicated, but the point is that if you're against the people that are the holiest, then don't be vocal about it or don't be that loud about it. If you completely disagree with it and you want to do your own study and still sit down and learn Gemara and Halakha, do that and go ahead with that. But the second you start speaking negatively about it, it becomes a very big problem. It becomes a big problem for, for every single human being. And, and what you're doing is you're causing Sinat Chinam because there's never been a Jew that's a Hasid that doesn't want to accept a person that doesn't accept, that, that's against the Halakha and the Kabbalah. But for some reason, the people that are against it are the people that are not accepting of the other Jews. So there's the Jews that destroyed the temple because they didn't love every Jew at the time. And then there's the Jews that loved other Jews. And usually the ones that were the simplest Jews and the Jews that were not of the people that sat down and learned all day long were the people that were the ones that loved every single person. And the people that had sophistication, which I'm going to get into at the end of the class, and the people that thought they were too smart or they knew too much or they did this and they thought of their own honor instead of the honors of Tzadikim and the honor of Hashem, then those are the people that fall. So that's usually where you know if someone's pulling from Erev Rav. I also personally, this is where it gets a little bit deeper. You sometimes even have unfortunate people that still sit down and study Kabbalah and Hasidut and stuff like that, but they accept a lot of honor. That's why in Breslev Hasidut, there's nothing more important than not having any honor at all. In fact, you'll see and you'll notice that the highest level, the degree of Hasidut in general, is when you completely are mevatel yourself. I'll actually show you guys a video after that I sent Franky of this Moroccan Sadiq. Um, and and, and I mean it, it, and it and it's incredible. It's a t it's literally a ten second video, but you will see just through a simple action, you will see the degree of humility that a person has, um, and it's and it's incredibly powerful. So I I'll, I'll show it to you guys after just to show you just a simple point how a fifteen second video could show you the difference between a tzaddik and and, and the opposite of a tzaddik. So um, that being said, though, last point on that, and then we'll transition. I don't want people to think that there's any form of judgment towards any Jew over here. It's just very simple that. I, it's unacceptable to speak badly about any tzaddikim, and especially the holiest of the holies. Um, the tzaddikim are essentially the merkava of Hashem. They act as the, the intermediaries of Hashem. They act as the kon gadol in present day. They act as all the concepts that help bring about the Mashiach. We have the Mashiach. If Hashem didn't want to send Moshe to save the Jews from Egypt, he wouldn't have. If he didn't want to send Moshe to bring the Torah, he wouldn't have. But there's a reason why this world stood with the concept of the tzaddik and the previous worlds didn't. So the tzaddik is incredibly important and it's actually one of the most important concepts and it's actually the root of the sin that happened with the golden calf is losing faith in Moshe. In fact, the only reason why they were able to do it because Moshe could have counteracted all this negative energy is when Moshe was not there. And so with that, we're going to now dive in a little bit more into kind of the idea of what's the deal behind this whole story. Why was it such a big deal? We know obviously there was a lot of impurity that happened. So Rashi actually says in the very beginning of this parasha, he says that, when the Jews will be held accountable in the end or whenever there's judgments for specific things, not necessarily in such a bad way, and we're looking at the negative things that we've done, there will always be a residue in every single thing that we look at in the future history of the Jewish people from when this happened all the way until present day, where part of it will always reflect back to the sin of the golden calf in some respect, which is incredible. Uh, but we always have a piece of that. And because in essence, in reality, what is idol worship? Idol worship is essentially making for yourself a set, another God. And when you make for yourself another God, what you're actually saying is that this God doesn't exist or this God is not relevant or it doesn't matter. We do this thing today as well. We do it with money. We do it with women. We do it with other things that are important in our life whenever we're not giving honor to God. The second you're not giving honor to God, you're doing idol worship. So that's why the root of every sin roots down back to this. Because the second you don't believe in God and you're not paying attention to God is the second you're doing idol worship. And so that's why this sin is so bad. But there were degrees in which they did it, and a lot of it we don't actually understand, but parts of it we can. And so the next thing that I'm going to actually do is I'm going to actually start diving in into some of the ideas of Rabbi Noam El Melech, who actually was at the same time as the Maggid of Mezrich, one of the, who was the main student of the Baal Shem Tov, and we're going to start getting into some Hasidut right now. And so to be able to get into this, we're going to draw a connection, which I've been actually, I was trying to draw before I actually saw some of these sources. So some of this, some of my ideas, and some of these I'm going to quote you from the sources, like right now, like I'm saying, Rabbi Noam Eli Melech, the Baal Shem Tov. But what's beautiful is I saw that there was immediately a connection between a golden calf and what do we have as the Chok, which is going to come up later on in the Bashiot, which is the main um, commandment that the Jews have that we don't actually have a reason for. There's this, con there's this concept of a commandment that we have that we're supposed to do it blindly without understanding the reason for it. And Zot Chukat Israel, essentially the chog, the main chok that we consider in the Jewish people is what? Para Aduma. It's the red heifer. It's the concept that we don't understand, 
We don't know why that there's this red heifer. It doesn't have any marks on it. So you bring it as a korban, and it does, and it corrects something that's called tumat met, which is the the impurity of the dead, which is the which is the lowest level of impurity that a person could ever reach. And we actually all live with tumat met today. We all live with impurity because we enter into hospitals, we enter into cemeteries, and we cannot remove this. The only way to remove it is with the kon gadol and with the ashes of the red heifer. So there's this concept that we will never understand that. But what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to connect the golden calf with the red heifer and trying to be able to dissect some of this stuff. So what Rabbi Noam Elimelech, and he actually quotes a Rashi from the Gemara and which talks about also um, specifically the sin of the golden calf. And it was saying over there, and Rabbi Noam Elimelech quotes from Toldot Yaakov Yosef from Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Polonoi, which was also, shockingly, also a student of the Baal Shem Tov. And he says from one of his teachings in his book, he says something actually really incredible. He says this concept that a tzaddik sometimes need to, needs to descend from his level in order to be able to help elevate the souls of the Jewish people. And he's specifically bringing this concept that's actually cited in the Gemara Avodah Zarah on page 4a, because in the Gemara, there's reference the concept that the Jewish people actually, the sin of the golden calf, with, the golden calf excuse me, was actually divine. The Jewish people didn't have any say in it. It was actually a plot from heaven to make them go through it. And the whole reason of making them being able to go through it was to see how they were going to react. Who said that? This is the Gemara, and there's lots of commentaries that say this as well. Okay? Now, this level of the tzaddik having to descend to be able to help elevate is actually a concept that we can actually really relate with. Rabbi Nachman actually expounds on it way more than anyone else I've ever seen. He talks about it in lots of lessons of Likutei Maran. He actually talks about it in lesson 66, where he says getting close to the tzaddik is actually one of the most difficult things and the test that Hashem is going to have to bring you. He talks about it on that lesson about the different melodies and rectifications. Um, there's lots of other lessons when he says traveling to the tzaddik, lesson 188, um, in being able to recuperate the things that you lost because the tzaddik needs you, for, you need him and the tzaddik needs you as well. So there's different types of things that, that are really, really well connected. Obviously, Breslev Hasid is very well known for discussing the concept of the tzaddik. But nonetheless, let's connect this to the golden calf for a second with the teachings over here that's brought down in Toldot Yaakov Yosef. So this holy tzaddik talking about two ideas. Number one, how does this connect to the golden calf? Because number one, when Moshe has to descend from the mountain, to be able to help elevate the Jewish people, this is the concept of the tzaddik descending. And when the Jews are then helped out by Moshe, or whenever a tzaddik helps someone out to be able to do tshuva, to be able to come back and repent, what this concept over here is the concept of elevation. So how's that connected to the golden calf? Because the golden calf, the person that the coin that essentially does the sprinkling on the clothing and, and helps purify the person whenever they've done a specific sin or whenever they come into interaction with the dead, the coin who is pure becomes impure and the person that is impure becomes pure. So it's remarkable how we get this incredible connection between one cow and one calf, essentially, and the rectification, which we know for the golden calf was to have the red heifer after that. So it's incredible that you have this concept of the descent of the tzaddik to enter into the filth, into the tum'ah, into the degradation of the Jewish people and the sins and the depression, to do what? To help elevate them, okay? The Ora Chaim, quotes from Rabbi Yechiel and Michel and says that there's actually a life lesson that we can learn from this and a, and a massive lesson, life lesson that we have actually from the golden calf in general. And this is going to all connect in a second. And the Khtam Sofer actually brings something that's also connected in terms of a life lesson. The Orachayim says that we learn from this the concept that it's very important in life to be able to help elevate other people. We learn from the sin of the golden calf that everybody needs to always look towards other people around them and have the ability to start thinking about how can I help another person around me to help elevate them if they're feeling down or if they're feeling low or if they felt like they've sinned to get close to God. And so from that on a very simple level, the Khtam Sofer says that the correction and the right mida keneged mida, right? The right um, tick for tit for tat or the right uh, measure, measure, measure mm -hmm. right? Which is the idea that everything has its corresponding on its opposite level, like we had Moshe and Bil'am. So, so too, he says over here, just as they had sinned with an ox, so too there's a concept that the sin of the child shall be put on the parents, right? And that's why we actually know mystically, I was thinking about this as a separate connection, we know that a child, until they reach the level of bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, mm -hmm. the sins are actually put onto the parents. And so what's interesting is the Khtam Sofra says, is that because the Jews had sinned with the ox, so too 
we bring a red heifer and we bring the mother cow to be able to come repair for the sins of the child. You could also draw another parallel to this, which I was thinking, which is actually really beautiful, which is the idea that a parent will always take upon themselves the sins of their children and try to rectify something for, other, for their children as well. And that's why also you see this idea, which is, um, you can also even bring this as a parallel, which is the idea that even if a person falls, right, you see this concept of being able to descend to be able to help elevate someone to lift them back up. And that's why sometimes you have to like bend down to be able to pick someone up or you see this whenever a kid falls down because the idea is that through the golden calf there Hashem wanted to create this capacity to be able to elevate from the depths, okay? And with that, I wanna share now the reason why specifically Moshe had to break the tablets when he came down the mountain. When Moshe came down the mountain and actually the Gemara and Shabbat says and actually the Psukim says, we can actually look it up if you want. Hashem says, uh, he tells Moshe go down because they're starting to do the, you know, all these procedures and stuff to do idol worship. And when Hashem tells this to Moshe, Moshe actually begins descending down. He sees it, takes the first tablets and breaks them. Um, we'll, actually, we'll actually see why breaking the tablets was actually a good thing. And actually God compliments Moshe. I'm not going to share it now, but I'll share it after the class if people want to chat a little bit with me after about it. Um, but what's incredible is that it says in Gemara Shabbat on... On page 105b, that the Jewish people, the Jewish people, and specifically in the connection with this parasha, mm -hmm. it says that whenever a person gets angry, and people have heard this concept before, if you get angry, it's as if you're doing idol worship. Mm -hmm. So in the Psukim, when it says that Moshe got angry and crushed the tablets, Moshe actually, what he was doing, and this is the words of the Baal, this is the idea of the Baal Shem Tov right now. Is he saying, now put all this stuff together of all these chassidim, he's saying, Moshe is coming down, he's seen that they've descended. He understands the concept that a tzaddik needs to descend to be able to help elevate the people that are sinning and that are down. So what Moshe does is he enters into this concept that people think that he got angry, but he didn't actually get angry. He does this form of anger to allow himself to do this fake idol worship, to allow himself to descend, to help elevate them, to help correct what they had done wrong. It's incredible. The degree of, of the level of Moshe, the Tzadik Yesod Olam, the concept that essentially to never leave the Jews behind, we'll actually see later that Moshe actually, when he goes and begs them for forgiveness, begs Hashem for forgiveness for the Jews, he says, if you don't forgive them, erase my name from your Torah, which we'll get into in a little bit. But, they, but we, we heard so many times, I mean, that I'll get into the version that the Shekhinah left at that moment. Yes. The, the, they, they were so heavy that they just fell. Yeah. You know, but what you just said is just so amazing. there there is different commentary. Some people say that the letters in the in the tablets started to leave. They started to leave the tablets, the holy letters, because they were inscribed and they were prepared by God. Um, after that, um, some people have different commentaries. But the fact that Moshe specifically had to throw them to the floor makes resonates a lot because the tzaddik partakes in the descent in order to help elevate. And so it's not a coincidence that Moshe specifically goes down to be able to help the Jews. Moshe specifically went down into Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yaakov went down into Egypt. We have Yosef that stayed down in Egypt as well. The concept that a tzaddik descends is something that's very holy and very special. But only, Rabbi Nachman talks about this in Likut Imran, only a very, very, very holy tzaddik can enter and descend into the darkness and be unaffected by the Tumah. That's why the first time I spoke about this with Datan and Abiram, Moshe had not yet re reached a level in where he was able to combat the impurity of Datan and Abiram. So he fled Egypt. He didn't flee because they said, oh, he killed an Egyptian and stuff like that. He okay. fled because, of the, it, because he saw that they were pulling energy from the previous world that had so much Avodah Zarah and so much impurity and so much confusion that they wanted to destroy the Jewish people. He had to leave. That's what he fled from. And then when he came back, he had the strength to be able to combat it. Now... It says in Gemara Berachot, now that I made a note of, at least for this one, on 32a, where it says specifically in the conversation over there, and we know actually that Aaron partook in the sin because they went to Aaron and Aaron had taken care of it. And in the beginning of the parasha, we actually say that Hashem speaks to Moshe and Aaron. And there's not that many times in the Torah where it specifically says that. I think it's 10 times. But specifically, it talks about in these sections that Hashem spoke to Moshe and Aaron. And the reason why is because they both partook in it. The interesting connection is that Lech Red is the, is the proof in the Gemara that says that as Moshe had to descend, he had to descend specifically, go and see them to help go into the pits to be able to help elevate them. And this is why Aaron, because he also partook in it, just as he partook in helping elevate them from the depths to help elevate them, Aaron is also the one that takes care in the Beit HaMikdash 
of help purify them whenever they fall as well with as the coin and as the as the priest that does all the stuff with the with the um the red heifer with that i want to actually share um a famous story of the Baal Shem Tov. So far we're at 45 minutes, so we're okay on timing. Um, but I we always get sidetracked a little bit, so we'll, we'll go. We'll continue going at this speed. So that's why they were forgiven, Aaron and Moshe? Aaron and Moshe specifically descended to help elevate them from that level. At first they wanted to reject, at first Aaron wanted to reject it, of course, like Hor, because Hor was Tzadik Gamur, but the problem was is he saw that they were gonna destroy all the Jewish people. And the only one that could combat it completely was Moshe. Aaron could have partly combated it, but it was not. It was not. Uh, it wouldn't have been able to be done because all of it. And actually, Likutei Alachot discusses. Rabbi Natan says how the real sin, like we said, was that they didn't believe in Moshe, and they wanted to find a replacement for Moshe. The Midrash actually says that the Satan had shown them images in prophecy of Moshe being dead, and his coffin, and the people elevating Moshe and doing this whole procedure in which Moshe had already passed away. That was the real problem. Otherwise, we don't understand because there's only six hours. It's a six hour difference. Behave like that only after being six hours. There's a, there's a lot for six. I mean, we talk about the six hours also between Adam and, and, and the sin of the tree. We have six We have six with the days. Six is also connected a lot to, to evil in some respects. And six is also um, the days of the week before the elevation of Shabbat. Um, so there is, a, there, is, there is a few connections with it, but on a very simple level, it was a very small amount of time. And that little window was enough to be able to create that doubt. On a very simple level, we realize that we have those same types of doubts even today. On a very simple level as well, we can learn something very practical from this, which is that even though the Jews, they saw all the miracles, they saw the sea split, they saw the man, they saw the revelation of God, and literally a... For 39, 40 days before this, they had the Ten Commandments revealed to them. They died twice because God had spoken to them. And after all those elevations and all those different types of reincarnations, by the way, there was things that they were doing rectifications, their souls to have to pass away, to have to come back to life, and then to be able to do this, which I'll actually get into in just a little bit. And after all of that, they still sinned on some degree of idol worship here to show you that no matter where you go, the Satan can always find a way. To be able to get you to fall. So have some have some humility and have some respect that Hashem and through connection with the tzaddik and only through connection with the tzaddik can we elevate ourselves to a degree in which we can be able to rectify our souls and further than that, really be able to connect with Hashem and be protected from the satan. We require this connection. It's literally imperative and so many people miss this. And to be honest with you, it's the only thing that really brings me a tremendous amount of peace in my mind is that the fact that I'm connected and I work a lot on my connection, I need to work more, on being connected to my tzaddik, Rabbi Nachman Abrasov, who vocalized the fact that he comes from the Nisham of Moshe Rabbeinu, essentially. So when you have a person of this degree, that this story keeps coming back, and you don't connect, it's, it's not that you can't rectify, it's that it's much more difficult. So very few people have done it. I wouldn't bank on that. It's much easier to just be one of the Jews like Yehoshua or Aaron that was just connected to Moshe. And it's much simpler because he does all the work for you. Um... And that, with that being said, you know, the story of the Baal Shem Tov that I wanted to share, and I'm going to do the story actually pretty quickly, partly because I don't want to waste too much time, but also because the most important part of the story is not actually the story, but what he says after the story. And so the Baal Shem Tov was very... <laughs> the Baal Shem Tov was very, very well known. L'chaim to that. <laughs> I'm going to share a story just to get to the end of the story. But... It's actually, whatever, it's funny. L'chaim te, l'chaim be'ezrat Hashem, only good things. So, the Baal Shem Tov, as we knew, used to travel a lot and used to help elevate many people and help do many types of procedures and help people's souls, help elevate souls and, and help bring people close, help find some of his Talmudim and uh, just do tons and tons of rectifications for the world. He had seen that he had to travel once to this town um, he had traveled to this one town uh, this one night on, on very short notice. He had gone into the town and had discussed with some of the secular drivers what was happening. He had gone to this town before and he went to, to the shul that he normally does for Friday nights and he began to set up shop over there at the shul even though he usually stayed by this one person's house. He decided to stay there and as the people started coming into shul to come to pray, the main person that usually asks him to stay at his house said, you know, kvodarav, kvodarav, and he came to the Baal Shem Tov, please come stay by my house by Friday night for the meal. And he said, no, not tonight. But when they did their prayer at the shul, 
and they had um, they had finished doing all their prayers for Arvit and Kabbalah Shabbat and all that. He had told every single person, don't go home to your meal, stay with me and let's read Tehillim. So he kept everybody at the shul from the town and they kept reading Tehillim until midnight, until Chatzot Araya. Okay? After that, he told them, you guys can go eat, but after you're done eating really quickly, come back again and let's continue praying. They did that. They left, they went, they did their prayers, and then they came back. The next day, same thing, tefillah. And this time he came to the man and he said, now you can invite me to your house for lunch. The Baal Shem Tov went to the guy's house for lunch. The simple Jew that had lived in the town, Sadiq. And at that point, a random knock came on the door in the middle of lunch. And it was a random um, person that was living in the, in, in the village at the time that was not Jewish, just a secular person. And he had knocked on the door and asked for a drink. The Baal Shem Tov nudged the homeowner, the Balabait, and told him, give him something to drink because he's going to share something with us in a little bit. Then the, after he took his shot and, you know, he did his, his drink, the schnapps that they, he gave him at the time, the Baal Shem Tov told him, tell everyone why you're here. So he had told everybody at the table that last night they had gathered and the, ma the main person that had been connected with one of the czars or one of the rich people in the city, it was one of the rich people in the city, not the czar, but a very, very wealthy non-Jew, had called all the non-Jews in the area to come and he gave them lots of arms and weapons to go try to kill all the Jewish people that night that were living in the town. And the reason for it was he had said it because the Jewish people, they didn't want to, he had become very stingy with his crop and he decided not to sell his crop for many, many years. And it ended up getting to the point that the crop was rotting through pricing and through inflation and through economic different type of you know movements that was happening in the pricing in the world. And what was happening is that the people and his advisors had told him that the Jewish people were the ones to blame because they were not buying and they were not selling and they were not being the merchants and they didn't want to sell your products. So you should go kill all of them. So he had that decision and he kept all the people up at night waiting for the right time to be able to go and attack their houses. Okay. Now, while this was happening in, in the temple the night before, the Baal Shem Tov said that he had ascended up to heaven and he had tried to see if he can remove this heavenly decree of killing all these people in this town. When he had done that, he had seen that the decree had been blocked, so he couldn't do anything about it. So what he ended up doing is he ended up bringing someone to go to the man that was in the town, that was in the field at the time, waiting with all the people with the weapons, and who he brought was this person's best friend that he hadn't seen in a very long time since he was a child, from 40 years ago. And this man came out of the carriage, and this man is saying the story now with the drink, and he's saying this random man came out and got out of a carriage. He didn't know this because the Baal Shem Tov is the one saying it. He just saw a man get out of a carriage. And he's saying he got out of the carriage and he started speaking to the man. And then after that, the man called back all the weapons and everyone went back home and no one did anything. So the Baal Shem Tov said, the man that I brought to him was his best friend from 40 years ago. But what the man didn't know is that the man had passed away many years ago because he hadn't seen him in many years. So I had to bring the man back to life to go see him to dissuade him and tell him that the Jewish people are actually good people, that they'll help you sell your crop, just wait till after Shabbat because they don't work on Shabbat, and they'll help you sell all your crop before it rots and you have nothing to worry about. And the man agreed with the man and then eventually let them out. What was actually beautiful about the story is now the main point, even though that's an incredible story of the Baal Shem Tov, and it's shocking, but it's also not shocking when you know stories of the Baal Shem Tov. Mm. At the same time, what's really incredible about this is we learned something very powerful and it connects to the main idea that we had with this class. Someone asked a question, they said, the Baal Shem Tov could have done all of this back from Mezibuj or wherever he was at at the time, so why did he travel to the town? Because he could have done all these elevations and sent the person there and taken care of all of this. So some people say the question is not a good question because he stayed with them, he read Tehillim, he stayed with them at night and he did some Tikkunim with them that were obviously very powerful and very helpful. But what's more powerful is the answer that the Baal Shem Tov gave. And the reason why the Baal Shem Tov went there, he said, because I saw that there was something that was going to happen in the town. So I could have done it from far away. But he said, whether or not it happens or not, I'm choosing to be there in case it does happen. Because I want to suffer with them if they suffer. Tzadik. And that's the concept of a tzaddik. Because the tzaddik says, I want to dwell in the lower realms. I want to dwell with you. I want to go into that darkness to help you out. And that's the sign of a person that's a true person. That's a sign of a true person that wants to be a good partner with you in life. That's a sign of a good person that's there to be with you in a relationship. People that are willing to descend and help you whenever you're feeling low to help go high. They don't care about making themselves low because that's what a true tzaddik is. 
The reason why I want to relate that back to Rabbi Nachman is that there's a famous story of Rabbi Noam Elimelech, and now we're staying with all these Hasidim, the Baal Shem Tov, the Magid. I'm actually going to share a story of the Magid of Mezrich in a second. But one time there was a famous story about Rabbi Noam Elimelech that after he had passed away, he had come to see one of his Talmidim. And I shared this story once that he saw in Shamaim that there was a heavenly decree. So he told one of his students and he told one of his people in a dream that there's something bad that's going to happen. But you have to pray very hard during Elul and during the months of Truva to help remove this decree. And the person started praying and they started praying, but they couldn't remove it. So he saw in a dream again after the end of the month came and they started getting to Yom Adin, they started getting to Rosh Hashanah. And he said, did they get removed up there in Shamaim? And he said, no, it didn't get removed. So he said, continue to pray, continue to work hard. So they continued to pray down low and in their shul and they kept on doing extra mitzvot and extra things. And they couldn't fix it. And then it came to Yom Kippur and it came to that. And he came to his rab after a certain amount of days after seeing that the decree was not removed after Yom Kippur and after arguing with him so many times. I'm sorry I'm making these stories quick, but I want to get the points across. Is that he told him, he said, I don't understand. You're up there and you're next to all the holy tzaddikim and you're next to Hashem. Why don't you guys remove the dinim yourselves? Why are you waiting for us to do it? You guys are holier, you guys are higher, you guys can do it. So what's the problem? And he said, for us up here, it doesn't look bad. But we know for you it looks bad. So for you, you have to ask for the helping and sweetening of the judgments because Hashem doesn't do anything bad. But in reality, you guys will perceive it as bad. You guys will see people sick. You will see people passing away. You will see judgments and you're not going to understand. So for us, we see the full picture, but you guys don't. So pray to help remove seeing all those veils. Now, something very special from that is Rabbi Nachman specifically teaches us something from that. Rabbi Nachman said something remarkable that I never heard anyone else say. No other tzaddik ever said this. Rabbi Nachman specifically said at the end of his life, I want to dwell with you, I want to dwell with you guys, I want to stay with you guys in the lower realms. And we know that Rabbi Nachman, specifically after he ascended, and after he went up, after he passed away, we know that obviously many tzaddikim are not dead. We're going to get into that in a little bit. But the main idea here is that Rabbi Nachman says that, why? Because when Rabbi Nachman specifically, people, if you ask someone or you say, where is Rabbi Nachman? They're going to say, okay, in Gan Eden, we're next to all the other tzaddikim. Rabbi Nachman is the only tzaddik that does not stay in Gan Eden. He stays down here. You want to know why he stays down here? Because whenever Jewish people are attached to their tzaddik, especially a tzaddik of this degree, which is the degree of Moshe, and they connect themselves to him, and they ask for help, and they cry, and they say, I'm struggling with food, I'm struggling with my girlfriend, I'm struggling with uh, my life, I'm struggling with not being able to pay my rent, I'm struggling with cancer, I'm struggling with this, God forbid, any test that a person is going through in life, no matter how difficult it is, when they say, and they cry to Hashem, and they connect themselves to the tzaddik, when Rabbi Nachman goes up to Hashem, he goes up and down nonstop for free because he has that capacity to be able to do that. When he does that, he goes to Hashem and he argues on our behalf. But every other tzaddik that's up there argues from the level of high. So when Hashem looks at them and he's arguing at them and they're saying, help this person out, make it a little bit easier for them. Hashem says, what do you mean? You're up here, you see the whole vision. But Rabbi Nachman says, I'm down there, I suffer with them. So you have to help them alleviate their pain. And he argues from the depths. And that's the concept of Moshe that descends down from Har Sinai. That only the Tzadik Yisodam can descend from Har Sinai to help people elevate them from that level. So from that, I want to go to a story of the Magid of Mezrich. And I'm going to start now wrapping up in the next 10 minutes with some of these ideas of Rabbi Nachman and some of the Hasidut to show you the importance of all of this. The Magid of Mezrich, this is a really, really, really powerful story and it's very, very short. The Magid of Mezrich one time had his son come see him and was crying. He's a young child, came to see him, and he started crying. He started crying, and I heard the story, by the way, by Avalon and Ava. It's good to give Hakarat Atov and share sources of where you read people's things because it's important to be able to help elevate all souls around the world. Um, and he was sharing the story because the Magid of Resmich had his son, and his son was crying. His son was crying when the Magid asked him. He said, what's wrong? He said, I was playing hide and seek with my friends, and it happened to be that everybody was taking their turn to hide and seek. And it got to my turn, and I went to hid, but no one could find me. So they all gave up, and they all left, and no one could find me. Yeah. And then, so he started crying to his dad. He said, no one would find me. Yeah. But listen to this. The Magid of Mezrich then started to cry. Listen, listen to this. The Magid of Mezrich started to cry also. And then his son asked him what happened. And he said, if you're crying because they can't find you, how many Jewish people are doing hide and uh, God is playing hide and seek because God essentially hides himself but we cannot find him so we give up and we don't find him <laughs> so he started to cry at that moment and in reality we live exactly in that world today 
And that's why it's to show you that sin of golden calf, that's why part of it is in every single generation what Rashi's words are so powerful, is because we're still living with the residue of the fact that we don't see Hashem and we gave up. We gave up because we don't see Him, so we're playing hide and seek, but we gave up on the hide and seek game. So to be able to get into that, I'm going to help bring it, hopefully, down a little bit more to earth with the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslev. And so as I do that, really quickly, we said earlier that the source in the Talmud and, and in many Mifashim and many commentaries say that the sin was from heaven. It was from heaven for one reason, the sin of the golden calf. It was already decided that this was going to happen. And the reason why it was going to happen is for one reason and one reason only. The concept of what? The Bar Tshuva. Hashem wanted to show the Jewish people that no matter how far you go down, you can always come back up. In fact, that's actually why we go back to the concept of the Mishkan. How does it go from a parasha where we talk about the Mishkanim, we talk about the Aaron, the Kruvim. Last week's parasha, we talked about all the secrets of the different items there. We talk about the Kon Gadol. We talk about the clothing. Then we jump into this massive sin. And then immediately we go back to the concept of the Mishkan. Right after the sin, and right after Moshe's argument, we go right back to it. And this is the measurements of the Mishkan. And then they go back to building. Why? Because immediately there's the ascent that happens from that fall. And that's the concept of rebuilding. That Hashem wants to give us the opportunity after a darkness to be able to find light. So the question is, what's so powerful about this? And the reason why it's so powerful, we actually learn from the Baal Shem Tov again. Because the idea is that the Baal Shuva and the idea that Baal Shuva stands in a place that not even a tzaddik can stand. But how is that even possible? How can a Baal Shuva stand in a place that a tzaddik doesn't stand? Baal Shuva is the person that has seen the evil, has tasted the evil, has tasted sin. And what does he do? He decides to come back to God. He's a person that's been far. He eats non kosher. He doesn't keep Shabbat. He doesn't know who God is. He doesn't know anything. He's done every sin in the book. But he decides to come back, submit himself through all the different types of tests and all the different types of troubles that a person goes through in life and say, I'm still choosing Hashem. The concept of Yitro, right? But the truth is that we all have to look at ourselves as Balei Tshuva. So let me give a parable. This is actually a pretty beautiful parable. I actually don't know if it was a true story or if it was an actual parable. I feel like it could have been potentially a true story, go back a few hundred years, but for the sake of it, just because we don't know the accuracy of it, let's consider it a parable for now. There was once a king that wanted to find a second in command, the second to the, to the king, the viceroy, to see who was going to be his second uh, position. And so he told his advisors, he said, let's find the best person ever for this. So they had tens of thousands of people that showed up to the palace and they wanted to compete they did months and months of competition and tests and, and, and different types of intellectual games to see the level in which a person could get to. They eventually got to the point that they started narrowing it down. After months, they got to three people. They said, these are the three best. He said, okay, let's take it from that level. The king said, now the final test is going to be to lock each one of these three people in three different rooms and to put a special bottle of the king's wine in each of those rooms. Now, the reason why it's more of a parable than a story is because the goal is going to be who gets to the next day without drinking the wine. Now, obviously, tens of thousands of people, and this is the final test to not drink wine for one night, is not a big deal. But think about it more from the perspective of, imagine a person that's a recovering heroin addict for his first night in rehab after 10 years of abusing heroin, having relapsed 10 times, and then being put in, the, in, the, in a cell with heroin in the same room. So think about it that way, okay? Now... Each person is put in the room, each with a sealed bottle of wine of the king. Everybody's waiting, everybody's there patiently, just at, like, not even patiently, really, just all antsy trying to see who's going to be the winner. The next day comes up, and everybody's coming, and the king's guards come, and everybody's there, and they're unlocking all the locks, and they're going to start opening up, and everybody's betting, and they're saying, oh, no, room number one's going to win, room number two's going to win, room number three's, and this person's the best person, this person's the best person. And they keep on going, and they keep on doing all their assumptions, and everybody's coming, and they're all anticipating, and they're all trying to see who's going to win. And they open up the first door and they see the bottle of wine closed and a man sleeping next to the bottle of wine perfectly. Unscathed, nothing is there. They say, wow, everybody's so impressed. They say, wow, it's incredible. The person didn't touch the bottle of wine. This person's for sure the winner. They open up the second room. They see a guy drunk on the floor. The bottle of wine open. That's my room. That's my room. That's my room. <laughs> I feel you. That's, that's the room, bro. The second, the second room, they see the guy in the room, um, plastered, having drank the whole bottle of wine. They get to the third room, and they open it up, and they see the bottle of wine is open, and there's a little bit taken out of the bottle of wine, and the guy's standing on the bed, and he's staring at the bottle of wine. 
He's staring at the bottle of wine intently. And no one understands. And the king says, he's the one that's going to be my viceroy. Why? He says, because he opened up the bottle, he tasted it, and then after that, waited all night and didn't fall again into his temptation. And from that, we learn a very powerful lesson from this parable. Because the idea is that the Baal Shuva is a person. What makes a Baal Shuva so special? What makes a person that comes back to God more special than a soul that comes into this world that only sits down in holiness? Because the soul that sits down in holiness doesn't taste any of the negativity. This is not to speak negatively of tzaddikim, God forbid, or people that you know, might be born into a very holy area of Israel and maybe they don't see any type of sinner, they don't see anything negative in their whole life. Those are different types of souls. We're not going to go into that because there's a lot to it. But the rectification of the souls that have come down into the last generation, specifically the generation before the Mashiach, specifically the generation that we are now, is the generation of the people that, have fought, that are fighting to come back to God. They're the people that are looking for God. They're the people that are saying, where are you, God? David, you mentioned earlier that uh, we have basically traces in our DNA of the sin of the golden calf. Yeah. Could it be considered, based on what you just said, that it's a... Uh, like an engraved reminder that we can make Teshuvah at any time. Exactly. That's the idea. And the idea is it's supposed to be a remembrance that we're supposed to come back no matter how low we go, we can always come back from it. No matter the worst sin, which is considered the worst sin, which is a sin that arguably some people even say that has not been completely rectified, is the degree in which that we have to understand that no matter how low we go, we have to go to be able to elevate all those sparks and help people come back to Judaism. And so the Tzaddik and the Baal Shuvah are separated because... The person that's about Shuva, he gets to a very, very, very low place. But from the lowest place, he's able to be able to come back and get close to Hashem. We see from that actually something very special, which is that, um, you know, I wanted to connect this back as just a personal thought that the whole idea really of the red heifer is that, like we said earlier in the class, we had tried to connect it to the Para Duma, which we're actually going to share in this week's parasha. We're going to read the section on Para. We're going to read the, the Chok of, of Para in this week's parasha. And I think it's really deeply connected to this sin. And the reason why it's connected is because there's this concept that a Bal Shuvah, why does he stand in a place that a Tzadik doesn't stand? Because it says that his sins turn into Tzchuyot. They turn into Mitzvot. And he becomes completely clean in front of Hashem. What's remarkable is I was thinking that this is actually probably connected to the Para Duma. Why? Because the paraduma, it says that it cannot bear any load, it cannot bear any weight, it cannot have any marks or any blemishes on it. Weights that are put on things are considered burdens, sins. And the blemishes are the negative things that we've done. So how do you rectify the golden calf? By becoming pure yourself. And how do you become pure? By becoming a Baal Shuvah. By descending, by after the descent, you are able to ascend, purify yourself, and you become the red heifer yourself. And to Hashem, my understanding at least, is that in a person that becomes a Baal Shuvah, he actually becomes a Paraduma to Hashem. And he becomes a complete Korban to Hashem. A complete Ola. And that's what's very special actually, which I'm going to get now finally into my last thoughts and my last notes. When the Midrash said that they saw the body of Moshe that was dead, okay, there's this really incredible concept, which is that brought down in Likut Alachot and Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Natan talk about this. They say that the main sin and the main thing that they did wrong was what? that they try to find a replacement for Moshe, all right? Now, what's really deep is that whenever you try to get close to God, back to the idea that the, paradu that the golden calf was not really their choice, that it was just thrown on them, it's just a question of how you want to get up. God throws at you things in a way in life that he pushes you away to see how you're going to come back. It's a very big concept. It's brought down in Hishtab Chut Anefesh. It's brought down in lots of the books of the Hasidim. The Baal Shem Tov talks about it. And the main idea is that once you get pushed away, the question is, God wants to see how badly you want to be able to come back. And so what's really beautiful is that when the Jewish people, they had sinned over here and not being able to find Moshe, they also had done one other thing that was wrong. And Rabbi Natan writes it in Likwit Al-Achot, and he essentially says that the Jewish people thought that Moshe was dead. So it's actually black and white. It's pretty simple. You think, okay, Moshe is dead, so they, they wanted to replace him. But the whole error is that they thought Moshe was dead. Because in reality, the tzaddik does not die. And this is why the Zohar says that Moshe lo met. Because in reality, had they believed that Moshe, at first they thought even worse comes to worse, Kaviachol, right? It's not even a thing that's even that bad. But let's just say, Chaz Shalom, Moshe would have been considered dead. 
right? And even today, Moshe is not even considered dead. But let's say they had considered Moshe dead. Rabbi Nathan said they should have gone immediately to Aaron, to Yoshua, and to Hor, right? Because what would have happened at that point is that the students of the tzaddik that have properly followed the tzaddik know exactly the way of the tzaddik. And they know how to take you in the path of the tzaddik. So they would have told them what to do next because they become part of that. This is also part of the depth of whenever you attach yourself to a tzaddik and the tzaddik descends, when you attach yourself to a tzaddik, you take his ascent. So he does the ascent for you, you just hold on. But if you don't hold on, or you don't have a tzaddik to hold on to, you're not capable of doing this ascent. And so what they should have done is they should have attached themselves to immediately Aaron and to Yeshua and to these other tzaddikim because what would have happened is they would have been able to ascend and not fall to the golden calf. And that's what they should have ideally done instead of falling to the golden calf. But instead when they fell, they thought that Moshe was dead, but in reality, Moshe is not dead. Uh, David, at the same time, when Habib Nachman physically passed away, the, his, his uh, students, they wanted Habib Nathan to take over. Yeah. And they made a mistake at that moment. Mm. Rabbi Nathan famously said, he essentially explained, and it's written multiple times, he was pursued not only by Breslavers, but people that were Midnagdim, of course, and even the other Hasidim, because that's how pure the Torah of Breslav was, that even people that were in the Hasidut didn't even like it. Keep in mind, people also don't understand something very simple. Rabbi Nachman is direct descendant of the Baal Shem Tov. And Rabbi Nachman, from, the, from Rabbi Nachman, because he comes from David HaMelech, mm -hmm. the, the Mashiach is going to come from Rabbi Nachman as well. So, specifically, through his lineage. So people don't know simple facts about Rabbi Nachman Abreslev, but Rabbi Nachman Abreslev is, is nothing, nothing to be put lightly. Um, part of the hiddenness of it is that, like Moshe, like Moshe disappeared for a little bit to go up the mountain, um, People don't, don't really understand the concept of what Rabbi Nachman really is. But in reality, this is the concept of the real Sadiq. And so lastly, I would like to end with something very, very special. There is um, a lesson in Likuti Maran, lesson 12 um, of book two, which is a very famous lesson, which is the lesson of what? Ayyeh. It's the lesson of calling to Hashem from the pits. So with that, I want to share with you guys one last thing, and then I'm going to show you guys a little secret that's in the, in the parasha. Look at how lesson 12 of book two opens up, okay? This book is falling apart. Um, right here. I'll read it to you. I could do a little bit in the Hebrew, a little bit in English. I'm just gonna read you little parts because it's a long lesson, but just a couple little lines here and there. When a person goes after his own wisdom and his own intellect, he can fall into great mistakes and errors. And I'll continue in English a little bit. Which can bring him to great spiritual harm. This is the idea, this is why Rabbi Nachman wanted everyone to be very simple. Because the second you start thinking that you're smart, or you have kavod, or you're earned something, or you do something, and you don't actually connect yourself to the tzaddik, the errors actually start to come. And worse, if you don't actually think you're doing errors, and you're trying to do every single halacha in the book, but you're not doing any mistakes, or you don't think you're doing any mistakes, you're actually working, on the op you're working for the opposite side. So over here he says, many have caused great spiritual damage, such as very fit, infamous uh, wicked people who have misled the whole world on account of their wisdom and intellect. Some can connect this to the Arab Rav. The essence of Judaism is to live sincerely and simply without any rationalizations. Rather, one should see it to that everything that one does is for the sake of heaven and not be concerned at all about one's personal glory. Lesson six, by the way, starts off, and we've been doing lesson six for a little while. It starts off, that every single person needs to decrease one's honor and to increase the honor of God. The whole point of the lesson, it's the lesson of Tshuva, it's the lesson we learn in Elul. It's the time when Moshe went up for the second tablets. Is actually the first of Elul. He comes back on the 10th of Tishrei. He comes back on um, Yom Kippur. Is, and that was the, the ultimate forgiveness, right? Is that the Jewish people need to understand this concept that through this salvation and through this 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 coming down, that lesson was given in that time of uh, being able to do tshuva. And he says over there that everybody needs to lower their own honor. The truth is that today you can actually see, unfortunately, this is very unfortunate. We're gonna show that video after. You're going to see how we've lost the concept of what it is to be a simple Jew. We really have. There's a lot of sophistication. There's a lot of, I think I'm smarter than you. I'm gonna share my Torah. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. People have completely lost this to the concept of real tzaddikim. You want to see real tzaddikim go back 50, 60, 70 years, even 30 years, you see people that are very simple, very inept Jews. And in fact, the simple Jews are the ones that are going to help bring the Mashiach. Just a couple more points. This is the main one. Valken, and this is a couple paragraphs down. 
So when a person falls down to such filthy places, Shadam nofel chaz veshalom lebichnat mekomo ilu, right? Or elu shayinu bichnat mekomot ha metunafim, right? These disgusting and these dirty places, which is the concept of the egelaza, to fall into a place where you do idol worship, right? Which is essentially when you fall into a dark place. What is idol worship? It's just not believing in God, right? That's the parallel today. Venofel le sfekot, right? Sfekot is what? Doubts. Why? Because you have too much intelligence. So what happens when you get attacked in your intelligence? You have a doubt. But if you're a simple person and you have your simple faith and you're connected to your tzaddik, you don't have any type of doubts. And massive types of confusion. And he starts to realize in that descent that he starts to look upon himself. And he starts to look deep within himself. And essentially he's saying that he's very far from God. Why? Because the Jews felt that they were completely depressed. They felt even from their, their levels that they were at, where they saw God in every single moment. They saw him in every nook and every crevice in the world. They saw him in the miracles of the sea. They saw him in Egypt. And what happened? They felt a depression of not seeing God. And as we quote, and we do this in the Musaf on Shabbat, which is one of the holiest moments, actually many special, many tzaddikim could actually do aliyat neshama in this moment in the tefillah. Other holy tzaddikim could do aliyat neshama really whenever they wanted. Rabbi Nachman was one of those types of people. But when you say, Aye makom kevodo, you're crying from the pits. Also, we talk about in Tehilim. And when you do that, you have this ability to be able to scream to Hashem and you say, where are you? Actually, Hashem uses the word Aye whenever he's talking to Adam after Adam sinned. There was actually the moment when Adam sinned and ate from the tree. He was hiding and then he was saying, I'm hiding from God and he was hiding because of his nakedness. But Hashem uses the word Aye. He says, where are you? If Adam, Rabbi Nachman says, if Adam responded and said, Aye, and he scrammed, where are you, God? After his sin, he would have rectified the world on the spot. We wouldn't have had to go into the world that we have today. But Adam felt embarrassed and fell into that darkness and fell into depression and found into the, naked, the nakedness that he had, which is the nakedness of seeing sin, essentially. And the mitzvot are considered clothing. That's why tzaddikim have garments. Rabbi Nachman has a lesson on this in the Quran. When you're tzaddik, the tzaddik takes off his garments and he gives you garments in the world to come so that you're covered and you're clothed. And you look beautiful with your clothing because the clothing are the forms of mitzvot and the prayers that you have. When you do this, and you see that you're very far, and this is allowing him to be able to begin his ascent and to be able to be able to go up to a higher place. We're not going to go continue with the lesson, but the whole point is that from here we see the very beginning of the lesson talks about removing your intellect and being able to get close to God being able to connect with Sadiqim and being able to call out to God from the pits of descent. We learned a very powerful lesson from this and I didn't spend so much time on the teachings of Rabbi Nachman this week, but nonetheless, it's very powerful still. Whenever we get to this point, we deal with the Egel Azav every single day. We deal with these types of sins. We deal with these types of depression, no matter how much God reveals himself to us. We have to ask ourselves this question, right? We have to say to ourselves, like the Maggid of Mezrich had with that story, he said, how much do you see God? Did you give up? The question is, what do you do whenever you're depressed? What do you do whenever you don't see God? What do you do whenever you don't have tzaddikim next to you? What do you do whenever you're not doing the mitzvot? What do you do whenever you're not going to shacharit? Do you believe in the Mashiach? Do you believe that the Mashiach is going to actually come? I know we have to, right? It's one of the principles we say every single day, right? That Mashiach is going to come and we believe in it. But the question is, are you waiting for Mashiach to come? Are you begging Hashem for Mashiach to come? Are you crying over the destruction of the temple at 2 a.m. at night? So... The question we have to ask ourselves whenever we get into this, this humility of recognizing that we are far from God. We are in the concept that we don't see Him anymore. We're not playing hide and seek. You have to scream Aye. Because when you scream Aye, you're playing hide and seek with God. And you're starting to re-enter into the palace of God and you're starting to ask God. And what happens with that point? It's like the child that falls, the parent picks them back up. It's the concept of the Baal Shuvah. It's the concept that the Jews descended in Moshe, the Tzaddik, went down to be able to lift them up. And the beauty of all of this is that to prove all of this, really, there's a beautiful idea that as we know that Sadiq descends and he says no, after the passage that happened with the golden calf, Moshe then eventually goes up to Hashem and tells him, you know, he tells first the Jews, I'm going to go pray on your behalf and I'm going to pray that hopefully he accepts your, your tshuva and mercy. And over there he says, and this is very easy to remember if you guys want to look this up, in Shemot, in the book of Shemot, Lamed Bet, 32, chapter 32, Pasuk 32, verse 32, you have the interaction, by the way, the gematria for that is lev and lev, so heart and heart. So there's not a coincidence for this, by the way. And there's not a lot of coincidences because the same coincidence also in the Gemara 
that we had said earlier in Brachot, that discusses also 32a, in the reference to whenever Hashem told him to go down the mountain, which is the concept of going down. We know the concept of what? We say that this is like a korban. So I realized also something else when I was working on the Chidush. The korban ola, there's a very special korban that we give, which is a korban ola, which means that it completely goes up and it's completely accepted by God. There's other korbanot that were also burnt in its entirety, but no one eats from it, no one takes from it. It also cannot carry any blemishes, and it also has to be perfect in its own right. So whenever you give yourself in completion to God, you do that. Now, ola, if you spell it, is ayin vav lamed hey. Ayin is 70, vav is 6, lamed is 30, hey is 5. You have 111, which is the gematria of the aleph, which teaches us the lesson of the yud, the vav, and the yud. Also, if you also look at it, the um, lesson in lesson six that talks about bakiba, what's it bakiba shov, the lesson that talks about ascending and descending, going up and going down, dealing with sin, is also similar because baki is also a reference to that, which we talked about, which is the same as yabok, which is the river that Yaakov had to pass, which is also the same gematria, plus one. So now you're seeing that there's all these connections. The last point that I wanted to bring up everybody was that whenever you see it kind of all come full circle you see the same idea pop up in um where is this little note that i had put over here um the same thing that i had brought up with like i had said with the aleph which represents the complete shuva because if you look at the upper yud the upper yud at all times is always descending back down to be able to receive the lower yud. And that's why it was referenced in the dream of Yaakov that he saw the angels ascending and descending. Why? Because it's the concept of the Jews that go up and they go down. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And that's why they come down first and then they go back up. And Yaakov saw that. So Yaakov was able to understand that even if he descends into the house of Lavan, which to come full circle, which is the Bil'am, or essentially the Gilbul, which, uh, which essentially would be Bil'am, is that he was going to enter into the darkness to be able to help eventually take out the souls of who, right? Which we have as Rachel and Leah, which eventually bring down the tribes, which bring down Yosef into Egypt, and then eventually brings about the story with Moshe. So you have all this preparation learning from the letter Aleph, which is also found in the concept of Olah. So whenever you rectify yourself and you work on yourself and you do tshuva, you make for yourself a korban. You make yourself a korban Olah. Essentially, you ascend up to Hashem in its entirety. The last thing I wanted to share Perek Lamed Bet, Pasuk Lamed Bet, chapter 32, verse 32. V'ata im tisa chatatam ve'im en mechanenina nesifrecha asher katavta. Macheni, or mecheni. Moshe says, and if you don't want to wipe away their sins, ve'im en mechani, right, to erase me, essentially. Mesifrecha, erase me from your book. Because Hashem essentially wanted to tell Moshe, let me start again with you. And in reality, this was a test from heaven, not only for the Jewish people with the golden calf, but this was also a test for Moshe to see if he was still a tzaddik of that degree, to see if he was really the tzaddik Yisod Olam. But the tzaddik Yisod Olam said, what? I don't leave without my kids. So no matter how bad it makes me look, I'll descend. Rabbi Natan says that he broke the tablets. Why? Because the tablets said, don't worship other gods. So had he had that after receiving that 40 days earlier, had he given it to them, they would have been judged and killed on the spot if they had to follow that. So he said, I'm breaking it. I'm taking it upon myself that that's no longer the Torah for them. And I'm destroying that so that they're not going to be judged of that degree. That I'm going to take it upon myself to rebuild from there. So immediately, not only did he descend, not only did he go to the lower level, he didn't even want them to do it. He was willing to destroy the handmade tablets of God. If you look at the words in Perek Lamed Bet, Pasuk Lamed Bet, at the words, erase me from the Torah, at starting from Mehanina, if you read it backwards, you have the letters Aleph Nun Yud, Nun Chet Mem Nun, which spells Ani Nachman. You like that one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the whole idea of the Tzadiki Sodalam essentially is to be able to cry out from the pits and to be able to scream to Hashem and to be able to say, from wherever you are on the lowest level, to be able to get close to Hashem. The only way in being able to do that is to do Moshe. And the Satan and the Yetzirah and everybody fought at the moment when Moshe disappeared to make it look like Moshe died. But the sin is to not realize that Moshe never leaves us, to realize that Moshe is always alive and Moshe is always here to help us. And Bezad Hashem, in the merit of connecting to true tzaddikim, will be able to bring the Mashiach and rectify all this. Amen. Does anybody have any questions?
That one, that one went a little bit longer. Also, yeah, I've been, I've been very bad with, uh, with the timing of the, uh, <laughs> with the timing of the classes. But I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be better next time. I mean, you can, it is the same sentence. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
a noon is drawn. I'll do this for you right here. This is in the Safrut writing. All right. This is what a noon looks like. <laughs> so this is what a noon looks like, but the Daled. The, <laughs> the Daled, because Hidbonenut has two ends and the Daled has, um, has two Daleds in Hidbonenut. Now what's special about the Daled is that the Daled, you can see all the weight is at the top and nothing is at the bottom. And the Noon has all the weight at the bottom and no weight at the top. So whenever you're doing this, when you're with your mind, you're dwelling down here because you're trying to connect and you're trying to think too much. But when you put, when you have the Dalit, Rabbi Nachman says, when you do it bodidut, you throw all your imunat to Hashem and you say, Hashem, you take care of everything. I'm keeping just my feet on the ground. Okay. <laughs> That's why he bodidut is very special. Wow. <laughs> so the, what's very special is that, um, yeah, we have to be able to, rem we have to throw away our, our chokhmah to kind of come full circle because the truth is that chokhmah is, it's damaging the intelligence, the, the exterior philosophies. It's not to sit. It's not to sit down. Rabbi Nachman was very against it because, in reality, all the different types of knowledge that people are going to study, and the different types of intellects are only going to bring doubt. It's only going to help bring confusion. It's only going to help bring the egel azav. But if you connect to Hashem in simplicity and work on your character and you pray to Hashem and you ask Him to help you out, you will Hashem will open up the doors and you're going to be able to be able to become a merkava to Hashem. You'll help become a vehicle for Hashem's glory in this world. And the best way to do that is to say that you know nothing. Because when you know nothing, you actually create a void in your mind. And when you create a void, Hashem can come dwell in that space. But if you fill yourself up with intelligence and boastfulness, and, and you're too big, there is no space for Hashem. So that's the whole point. That's why He says throw it all away. And the beauty of when we forget is it's actually a beautiful thing because Hashem allows us to be able to, re, to be reborn and to do hit chashut. So that's what's very powerful about it. It's very counterintuitive, but he was the only one that spoke like this. Rabbi Nachman was the only person that spoke like this. Other people were just like, sit down, study everything, be the smartest person in the room. You understand that even today, people grab kids in yeshivot at the age of three, four, five, seven years old, 10 years old. Even today, I want the smartest kid. I want my kid to go to Harvard. I want this. It's the exact opposite of what he's saying. He's saying, throw all of that to the trash. He's saying, don't not sit down and don't study. But he's saying, don't make yourself big. Don't fill yourself up. Learn. But then after that, make yourself small. Say, Hashem, take away everything from my brain that's not worth something. Because if you start studying and you start learning only for the purpose of being smart, then Hashem is going to give you, okay, take the chokhmah. But in reality, if you believe that Hashem can do everything, then Hashem can take away your chokhmah tomorrow. God forbid Hashem can take away all your memory. But the highest level is being able to just live with Hashem but being completely empty. Being completely empty and only creating a space for Hashem. Actually, with that point, let's show the video. Do you have the video on your phone? Because my phone's my recording. Battery, my battery is dead. Um, um, it's just uh, I can't amazing. wait. You know what? I'll show it to you guys. I'm, I'm going to end this recording. Okay.